come to it. Let me tell you about Rome that. Rome's contention with the Middle East, Judah, Israel, was that it needed to control the spice routes. Because without spices from the East, especially from India, pepper and rock, uh, so rock salt had been over. They had mined up whatever rock salt they had. Salzburg was one of the rock salt places they mined it up. So they required fresh supply of salt, which was available only in the Middle East. They came across this phenomenon where they were given two tight slaps on their cheek and we learned a lesson. They used to pay occasionally and randomly. The soldiers revolted, I think it was 50 BC or something, but now it's going to be And then they were told that you are asking us to fight the Arabs, and these Arabs are pre Islamic Arabs. And they pay their soldiers in the most valuable commodity. You pay us a soldita, a coin of silver. <laughs> they pay us in the most valuable commodity, and that is salt. Namak haram, namak halal, namak etc. So we demand it in salt, and they revolted. The Romans wanted to crush the company. They absorbed it, accepted it, and started paying in lumps of salt. It's called salarium. Salary. So this is how subordinate cultures, all the subordinate can also teach us back. Greece was supposed to have been captured by her captors. Well, it's happened all around. In India, if you come across, and though I do agree with most of what Professor Ramal Singh has said about the Aryan myth, I have been tormented with this question for a long time. But let us go into the philological and the linguistic evidence only. The language is Indo-European. Indo-European doesn't mean that it's centered around Europe. Indo-European, no doubt about it. Root words, Uparniche, Aparni, all the alphabets, including Sartam, Dasham, everything is common. The pronouncing of these alphabets are different. And different for different parts of India. Bengal, for instance, thinks that English is an extension of Bengali. You can pronounce it whichever way you want. In Bengali, spoken in different, just with a little Angrezi twang. So, this comes up, and we find that the first god, globalized god, is common to all Indo European cultures. And his name in the Vic Rig Veda, we talk of Vedic culture, we talk the Vedas. I don't know how many people have read the Vedas other than the Vivek De Roy. <laughs> So you will start off by saying that the first god that we find of massive proportion is called the Yushkita. Yushkita, it is a conjunctive word, DZH, from which you get word Jupita, Jupiter. You get Yushkita, Zeus, and he comes in as the first god who is a complete box of his disaster in India. You never heard his name. He was a disaster. Jupiter. Zeus and Jupiter did not fare on the Indian soil. Then comes Neptune. Hmm. Look on Neptune and we get the god of thongs, thunders and all that. He has to take in an Indian name under the Indian law. It's called Indra. Hmm. Another person who reigned for some more time with all European characteristics but could not predict the sudden storms of India very much like half our people, one half, you never know when it, the storm breaks out, the unpredictability of the storm and because of his faulty predictions, he degenerates into the suffix of a name, the Raminder, Raminder, he remembered only as that, never has it, you have a temple that is worshipped for him, so much so for the globalized gods, India can get its own back. Now we can go back, I voice my concern in a zigzag manner at the Mickey Mouse is of the world. Mickey Mouses were required there because they had no icon to fall back on. Yeah. Our Mickey Mouse, our mouse is under our elephant. I have always treated him. But then it speaks of a Magna Carta that is beyond frivolity. If you notice how the grand plan of India worked, almost all the animals that were worshipped in the primitive period, or I will use the word primitive, in the primordial period, were absorbed into the pantheon as Vahanas, except that three had to be made cabinet ministers. <laughs> These three are the monkey, the serpent, and 
the uh, elephant. All three are Indian, primarily, primarily Indian. The Indian elephant, as we call it, is distinguished from the right. The African, all three were absorbed in the European. The fact that we can mock the worship of a scrawny little, uh, squeaky little uh, mouse and the poo poo it away, at the same time, I would not like to insert our gods. Let us keep it at what I call the grand absorption. Now, while we talk of the globalization that is threatens to break down every fortification that every civilized culture could have put up, let us fall back and remember that the elements of globalization that come, the thaler, dollar is a Dutch thaler, which is made from the Holland, not from, not by American brains. The Frankfurter speaks of a particular European city. The Hamburger also speaks of a particular city. Their pizza is certainly not made by their Indians. It also comes from some other place. Even the absorption and then repackaging and marketing and acceptability or the non-acceptability that has started in American soil saying that this is a junk food. So there are both pluses and minuses to this equation. There is a perceptible wave of globalization. We cannot belittle it. There is a forceful force feeding of certain brands of culture against which voices are, feeble voices are being raised. But there is also the other side of it. What comes in the tsunami is not necessarily originated from that wave itself. When we think of it comes with a package that is dangerous. It comes with a package of a free lifestyle that have destroyed the family that we hold dear. It comes with a wanton degree of indulging in activities that we do not consider Khadurahu notwithstanding, we do not consider it to be a central element in life. But then, even if they didn't export it, we would have found a way out. These are urges that go with age. There's a German term called Zeitgeist, the spirit of the times. It will come with the spirit of the times, whether it is invented here or invented there. It comes with the dangerous consumerism, it comes with sex, it comes down with the fact to have breakdown of family values. And what hurts me the most is when I get this frantic call for the young kids. I call them young, anybody is 50 is young to me. Uh, huh? uh, 50 is young, you have enough time to make more mistakes the way I did. Uh, so, when I find that these kids ask us, where can I put up? Which old age home can I put up my liability parents? You know, sitting us. So there we are tackling the very roots of what was our emotional existence rather than our economic existence. So there are these threats. We cannot die, put them off. But then, again, coming as Professor has put it so beautifully, almost every food that we touch, and sir, exactly if you want, if anybody wants this proof, I have it with the temple food of Jagannath. I can scan and build. Where the entire list, I made a study of it because I found this was one of the purest places where the sanctity of what we call early Vedic. No, it was in the 14th century, 15th century, it's been up. And this was done around 1450s. This but then look at what Jagannath and Archipan. It emerged from the globalization or the Indianization of an autochthonous worship on which we had an entire project called the Orissa Research Project from the Sudhasana Institute of Heidelberg, where I've been called to speak, which came with Kulke, Eshman, Jesus Party, and the whole lot. It was a worship of a Kambu or Kambeshwar, which was of neutral gender. Neutral gender. So you could make it Kambeshwar, you could make it Kambeshwar. The description of gender. To a god or to a goddess would be a data development. In primordial society, we didn't care much because God would not be heaven or drift into a gender. So that itself was an act of absorption. But then with that absorption came a certain degree of fixation of identity. And luckily for us, because of the orthodoxy that prevailed, you know exactly which are the foods that came before and after. Came before and after. Um, I mean, I can give you a lot, some other day I'll tell you a whole lot of other 70 items that came. 
how to say this? <laughs> but then coming back, even rice, for instance, wheat, everything will be coming at some point of time. As I'm never tired of saying, India begins after we cross the Zabutin Bridge. Until the time we got stuck up, up to the Yamuna, the so-called Aryan civilization was a tent of books about the Naga, the Naga Kanyas and all these dark mysteries of the, of the wetlands to which we go from the dry lands. And if you see the Mahabharata, there is an entire chapter called the Sarpa Yagna or the Chattveja Yagna, which is devoted to the common theme of the destruction of the snake. The snake, the reptile and the dragon are motifs of evil. It's a very Semitic religion and from Canada all the way up to Punjab, it was followed the same system. Because it was conducive to the weather, to the climate. But the moment they crossed the Yamuna and got mixed up, started mixing up with the other browner and darker races, if I would take the native people of India, things started changing. The acceptance of, as you can see in the early confrontation between the two cultures, when uh, Satyavrat was up and asked for the hand of a fisher moon, fisher, okay, the moon, when Bhishma to take the Pratikna. So there are these confrontations, like, no, but may be on, but my simple, simple submission is only on the point of the reptile. The reptile from being a hostile creature that Janmeja had to burn in thousands to prove his purity, to prove his anger, to prove his so-called Indo-European culture, to later on be worshipped as you move along, up to the point of China, where its escape from the dragon is defied. And if you go west, you'll find the dragons, slaying of the dragon becomes a motif for victory of over evil. Just to look at China, dragon dance, which remains in some primitive form, some, some residual form and then you see the crossover from Afghanistan, you see at every point from Georgia all the way up to Canada, the dragon, the extreme form of the reptile being punctured by the shoe. Okay, now coming back, what is that culture that obsesses us? I will submit culture is just a reaction of a community, of humans, to the given circumstances physical and emotional. The physical component is to react with the nature and come up with the solutions. How many parts are required depends on what climate we are talking about. That's all. And emotional is where we give expression to aesthetics, to beauty and to non-tangible issues. When we sew it into our art and our art and architecture and language and make a fetish and halabula about it. That's all. I'm put, I can put it in nicer English. But, uh, so it, how many baths you take doesn't depend on how civilized you are. It depends on where you are and what is your condition. So a person who does not take a bath in six months, Shakespeare never did incidentally. Six months. Doesn't make him any less civilized. It depends on where you are and what your circumstances are and whether the water. The fact that you are drinking ale or beer means that the water is so contaminated that you better not touch it. <laughs> we now have switched on to our, our brand of bottled water. Yeah, water. Similarly, what to spit? As a particular civilization may believe that sneezing out into the handkerchief is the act of cleanliness. To an Indian, that may be there most horrible lack of uncleanliness will yeah. be back in your pocket. Yeah. <laughs> Spitting it out and be over with it may be a more cleaner, pure act. These will all depend on nuances of reaction between our availability of circumstances, our availability is there. That's all. There is no point in making a huge hue and cry about it and saying this is superior and that is inferior. The value judgment that goes with it is the first degree of indoctrination that passes off as socialization or is called acculturation. It is injected blindly into you at the earliest stages and as you grow up you are supposed to question every motive and if you are a troublemaker, professional troublemaker like me, you will go on saying it openly 
at the cost of whatever comes. <laughs> if you are a more tactful man, you will keep your arguments to yourself in your arsenal to be drawn up by the right time. It all that also depends on the physical makeup. So the toilet habits. Sixty percent of India does not have toilet, but toilets are required now. Now that there are no empty fields, <laughs> toilets are required now. But then taking it out there, even I belong to a generation, a very very urban one, where when we went to our relations, they were horrified at the fact that we had toilets within the house. <laughs> it was the most sacrilegious act that was possible. And they said that we will not go to your house because we have the toilet there. The toilet was taken as the impurest thing possible and when we went to their house, we had to do it in an adjunct room. And then come back, take a bath and then enter. I am sure this applies to most Indians who grew up that way. So these are again reactions to circumstances and embedding of the what I call the hardwiring of these values so that too much deviation is not allowed and each person does not think of for his own. But that amount of deviation would create a social chaos. The fact of putting in mandates to stop social chaos should not be treated as a license to hold others down. That is my humble submission. Now when you look at globalization, I think I'll send off by where you started. What is ours and what is theirs? What is theirs and what is ours is all a matter of subjectivity. If you ask an Indian, tell an Indian a bicycle was not invented in India, hit you on the head. Bicycle is a Harmonium, nowhere else except in India. You don't see the harmonium anywhere. Harmonium is this only in India. Only in India. I have tried everywhere. I have gone to the museums of music museums everywhere. I have not found the harmonium. I have found something very similar. Body. Similarly, the touch, London, cycle, marches, they all came in at different times and our culture was ready because that item was not there. That was the missing item. We readily absorbed it, took it, internalized it and internalized it. That's all. And that happens to all civilization. So I am submitting that it is a matter of man's and his group or his communities reaction to the external environment and his internal conditioning that constitutes what we call the sum total of culture. In fact, in sociology, it is a separate chapter altogether which calls the physical tools as civilization. And the mental part is culture. But let's not get more confused. We call culture as a holistic reaction and the management of external ecosystem. And each ecosystem produces a different reaction. The same person who never took a bath in X place would be taking three baths like our people do in the stickiest country, city like Calcutta. Maybe Chennai is a little stickier. Maybe I don't know. But it's hot and sticky. So you have to take three baths. There's no great funness about saying you have it in, there's no great virtue out of doing it. So culture remains at the bottom line. And our city, our culture has again gone through cataclysms in the last 70 years. We reinvented our classical culture and repositioned it to levels of divinity. A culture that nuances that were going down the stream were again brought back, cleansed up, sensitized, brahmanized, cleaned, packaged, repackaged, brought back. <laughs> We have brought it. The dance that was in a circular form in the Natta Mandapam, there were 150 people. I have measured the Natta Mandapams, I have measured how much it takes to per person to sit, how much it takes a dancer to perambulate, and 120 is what I could find in most temples of Tamil Nadu, except in the two coliseums of the Cholas. They were coliseums. And you see, what was meant for 100, 120, madam, I am seeing in front of you, 100, 120, because I think fortune of going to archaeology, having data from archaeology, archaeological survey, and also from the performing arts. So if you just mix it up and find out this figure of 100, 120, 150, this will basically prepare our classical dancers that stop talking of having no audience. The, this was the maximum audience we had. But anyway, the short point I'm getting is even that form was adopted from its circular direction to the proscenium stage, so that you have it once all in front. 
So adoptions, readoptions, packaging, repackaging, repositioning, cleaning up, sanitization, permanentization, everything has happened over a period. And she would perhaps that that great period of the 1930s with KCI here on one side and Mamutumma on the other side, those conflicts that took place. What started in classical dance in Madras would lead for the next 50 years in re-establishing and reinventing our classical forms back on to India with a retrospective memory tag to it. The years of neglect and the centuries of abstract centuries of absolute blindness, the dark centuries when we have no evidence of them were forgotten in an imagined continuity because that is the way Indians function. They gloss over the valleys into straight lines of imagined linearity of history. These words let me conclude that I come, I hope I have been able to manage to confuse you from more than where I started from. Thank you. Thank you, Jayana. You have suitably uh, collaborated by a thesis that only people who confuse us, enlighten us, engage us all together deserve to be here talking to the rest of us who are a very learned audience. But this art of obfuscating, confusing, enlightening all together is a rare art. <laughs> 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 so, I hope your appetite is waited suitably for Dr. Amrit Srinivasan and uh, Like a beautiful uh, Indian doctor and the family values which have been talked about, I am going to pick up the threads which Shantaji raised twice. First, she talked about uh, globalization and Americanization. And the next time round, she talked about uh, Modi through a Pakistani. So she's desperately trying to bring in issues which the other two speakers refused to enter into. <laughs> and I don't blame them. They are both senior diplomats and bureaucrats. And I am just a scholar. <laughs> My ex training is. I'm not a <laughs> I teach, I and if I confuse the kids too much, then they will open their laptops. So I uh, will not be as unclear. But I do want to uh, congratulate uh, Legends of India and uh, Shantaji that you have, you know, recognized this as a pendulum moment. If I may, it's a moment of change transition, you know it better than any of us here. And you have chosen such a moment to talk about issues which are key issues of our time. And certainly, I think you deserve to be congratulated also because you have recognized the importance of cultural identity as central and needing to be central to public discussion today. Uh, usually what happens is, culture is seen as a luxury in our collective discourse. You know, we tend to think about it, or we are expected to think about it only after <coughs> the Kapra Makan issues are taken care of. Uh, and in, definitely in our public spending, the priorities are on food, defense, infrastructure, before culture, philosophy, and the arts. So I am uh, well aware that uh, you, by giving seriousness to this issue, uh, have deserved to be congratulated. Of course, identity has been very important to citizenship. And because you raise the issue of local versus global, national is the bracketed term there, we have to talk about citizenship, without which we cannot talk about identity. So only difference being that over time, our cultural significators of our identity have been weeded out from official, the official domain. To take an example, caste. Today it figures on official documents, but it has been delinked from custom. What used to be, you know, caste and custom of the Indian people. Why? To give it a neutral, neutral in quotes, space next to, you know, biological or hereditary factors like age, sex, 
disability. If you see the forms, that's where caste does come. But it has been taken away from what its content used to be, that of custom. It is surely significant, and I have a colleague here who's worked on this very much more deeply than I have. It is surely significant that this mammoth planning commission exercise for the creation of a UID, a unique identification number for Indian citizens through the authority of India, UID Authority of India, it has a budget of thousands of crores and was begun in 2010. But it is the entire exercise is presumed not on a cultural but on a biometric identity database. The expressed aim also is to track people down so they don't cheat the government from getting <laughs> privileges. You don't have a cultural indicator of identity there at all. Clearly, the Indian state's Aadhaar card, as the IUT has come to be known, is assigning an identity. It is not acknowledging a pre-existing one, which captures features closest to what, as you, the earlier speakers mentioned, what we feel, our self-understanding of who we are, which is overwhelmingly cultural. It's an amalgam. There's regional, linguistic, food, gastronomical, occupational, familiar, religious affiliations, which make us human and different both at the same time. There's no body who's human who is not also different from some other human. And language is the best example of that. So the state's avoidance of culture, and it does avoid culture, as a source of citizen identity, lies precisely in its powerful and all-compassing nature. It's unconscious, it's life-embedded, and the state is scared because its own identity, what Anderson called the imagined community, is far more precarious, far more constructed, unlike culture. So the state and the government is afraid of cultural identity and keeps it out by and large. Historically, of course, and I do need to mention because we're talking about local and global issues, the modern state was formed on an enlightenment idea. It wanted to build a state, a nation. And to build it, it allowed, it incorporated otherness. You can't have a nation state, they realized, without otherness. People who work for you, or eat with you, or trade with you. But the serious issue here was that they separated out the private domain from the public. So you could be as cultural and as different and as pagan and as whatever in your privacy. But in the public domain, there had to be homogeneity. Now this is clearly an extremely artificial divide. It was a political solution, of course, to the horrors of racism, Nazism, which from the 18th century onwards, uh, uh, they were trying to uh, remove from their collective history, where not only political domination, but cultural domination had been exercised. So much so, and I remember in our sociology classes, we were categorically told we are not evol evolutionists. We are not diffusionists. Why? Because there was a ranking done that some people are at the bottom of the ladder are primitive, savage, brute, uncivilized, without culture. <laughs> A species impossibility. There's no human society without culture. So we are categorically told to stay away from evolutionism. And the modern state, to be fair to it, tried to get out of that, tried to encourage others to be incorporated. However, and this is a point I think we should note, especially in today's times, this emancipatory idea in the polar system, the ruling national culture was in the modern state meant to bring subject people out of their dark ignorance, vulgarity, paganism, whatever, by making them aspire to, to a homogeneous secular cultural ideal and identity. But this ideal they could always aspire for, even though they knew they might never attain it. We only need to refer to Macaulay's infamous minute on Indian education of 1835 to get a sense of world culture as inevitably secular but ranked. 
Macaulay bombastically had said, we only need a single shelf of English literature. Remember, he said literature, not the Bible. And it was said to surpass all the literature of the Sanskrit, Arabic, and Persian traditions. At the same time, there was a Christian imperative that natives were to be given a chance to access cultural improvement. They would, should be allowed to improve themselves, not through proselytization, but through the medium of English education. The flaw, therefore, in the colonial national agenda, despite this incorporating thing of permitting in English education, etc., was that this magnanimity was exclusivist in intention and based primarily on self-interest. Indigenous cultural knowledge was segregated. That's where the Mahabharat, poor Mrs. Sarkar, you looked at me for corroboration. <laughs> Not sure whether this, you know, academic would even know the Mahabharat. And he's not wrong. Our indigenous cultural knowledge was segregated and disempowered rather than allowed to develop in a parallel and pluralistic fashion with the high ruling culture of that time. As native subjects, we were destined to remain hybrids of high culture permanently. Brown on the outside and white on the inside. Coconuts, uh, Macaulay didn't use that word, but it has been used by others. And we were to serve as excellent interpreters and functionaries of the British government. That's another first the big wall knew of. Uh, this was, uh, as I say, the problem therefore was that predictably a national cultural identity for many subject people even after attaining political freedom from imperial rule, became a ranked outcome of their proximity or distance from the seat of power. Yes. So it was a reflected self-identity as to how close or far you can approximate the British or the ruling culture. Significantly, let's come to today, let's come to the newly independent Indian state, which relatively speaking is today. It was the most objective, secularized understanding of national culture as a special product of skilled, artistic, technological, intellectual human achievements. You know, painting, sculpture, literature, music, science, dance, which tended to take over public discourse. This was a conscious decision. And it became institutionalized in our ministries of culture, in our Sangeet Natak academies, in our Saitya academies. We're talking about the products of culture. We are ignoring consciously the enormous range and diversity of meanings the term culture refers to. You know, a particular way of life, the way we eat, sleep, pray, clothe, or not clothe ourselves. Cultural identity came to be selectively recognized by the modern Indian state as national only when it was abstracted from its local, regional, religious, and political roots. Yes, the folk was taken into account, but it could only be part of the national when it forgot its roots and became part of the mainstream, as it is called. I used to hear a jest in my youth, maybe it's around still. They would say, everyone has culture. Only Punjab has agriculture. <laughs> I, you know, it, it, it used to laugh, uh, maybe even feel a bit bad when I was young, I remember. I'm a Punjabi. Uh, I, but what does it presume? It presumes the selective ranked understanding, where Punjab only had a way of life, while Bengal and the South had classical, read, secular, music and dance, and a march on English education. So um, this ranking was inevitable to the very product of cultural identity and a national cultural identity. Now what is happening in that era which started to become the global era, I, I briefly need to mention that it really began after the collapse of the Cold War. In the 60s, the sound 60s, many people here will not even know what the 60s were. But Interestingly, exactly those cultural identities which have been suppressed by the nation state, religion, family, uh, uh, language, began to surface in the public domain. Some called it the empire strikes back. All the 
humiliated, ruled, subject people began to assert themselves through a self-identity. The democratic state, and this uh, Sarkarji will know, was helped in building a mass society by technology, Doordarshan, television, radio. And these new broadcasting and communication technologies paradoxically made it easier for those very people to express protest at the slight that had been shown to their self-esteem.